Cool. We are recording. Um, awesome. Thanks so much for coming, everyone. Uh, this is our second Octatrack study group meetup. Um, really excited to share a uh, topic today is sequencing. So um, before I switch over to the Octatrack view, I wanted to just talk really, really quick about my uh, philosophy is a strong word, but like approach or why I sequence or how, like why I do it this way and why I think it's really fun. Um, just so you kind of like know where I'm coming from and like how this might fit in with what you do. So uh, I write, how do I describe it? Um, I've been writing electronic music for uh, going on 20 years now. And I've always, I started out sequencing MIDI. Um, I had a, uh, I, I, I got this the CDR of pirated, it, it like sharpened on it. It's a pirated writing music software. And like I popped that in and like there was this application called Hammerhead, which was like a really simple like step sequencer. Um, you can look up images of it, it's beautiful. You can like load samples in. And it's everything I ever wanted. You could load four samples and you could sequence and you could change the volume. Um, I think it only had one pattern, it was so rudimentary, but I would use that over and over again with SoundForge and I would build up like a loop and then like make larger songs with it. So my entire musical electronic sampling um, perspective is kind of informed by that. I really like doing a field recording or sampling a synthesizer or a drum machine, um, getting s s sound design kind of discreetly done in one step, um, having my group of samples. And I love doing really intricate interlocking um, sequences of different different lengths so you get crazy polyrhythms going like you have a track going in three four and a track in four or four and a track in five and a track in seven and then i just love that interlocking um aspect of it and like seeing everything and knowing okay there's a rest on the third beat here so on this track i'm gonna have it do a thing and like i just love that part of it so i love really really complicated interlocking sequences and that's uh, the first thing that I gravitated towards with Octatrack is how to approximate that or reproduce that or improve on it. And it's it's the most fun I've ever had. Like working on the Octatrack is what I've always wanted making electronic music to be like. Um, okay, so I should probably do it for the preamble. Uh, if there's any questions or feedback, I think someone posted, is this a picture of Hammerhead? Is this, oh yeah, oh baby. Okay, there's 16 steps, not eight. Yeah, and we've got the Windows XP, uh, <laughs> the Windows XP Chrome around that. It's beautiful. Um, all right, cool. So again, I'm going to switch over to the other camera. Um, if anyone says anything in chat, please, uh, someone let me know because I'm not going to be able to see it. Um, is the chat just general? What's that? Where is the chat? Oh, if you click um, at the bottom of the screen. Yeah. Uh, if you click at the bottom yeah. of the oh, screen, there's okay. a chat. Got it. This is my favorite standalone instrument that I haven't built myself. And uh, every time I play it with. Hey, Diego, welcome. Um, if you were talking, you're muted. If you weren't talking to us, Work on. Uh, okay. Um, can you all hear me? Okay. Yeah, you sound fine. Yep. Okay, sweet. Um, all right. So I am going to start completely with the Octatrack off. Um, just so you all know, the only thing that's going on right now is the Octatrack, and then we've got a MIDI controller. Uh, that's plugged into it and that's programmed. Um, all this is going to be doing today is pretty much controlling levels of things. Um, okay, so we're going to start from just a totally bl blank project. Um, Hey Ryan, welcome. Just uh, just in time. Hey, awesome. Okay, so we are just going to create an empty project. Um, I'm just going to call it a study. And 
And then for most of today, we're probably just going to work with one track. Um, but I do want to uh, set up the. Um, I want to. I want to have a master track, so I'm just going to turn that on. So that'll let me control volume with this fader here. Um, cool. So then what we're going to do, I'm going to remove all the effects from this just so we're uh, working with, we've got a flex machine now. Um, all the settings are just initialized, no effects, just as simple as possible. So then I'm going to go over to our um, source setup and I'm going to choose one of the chains that I sent. So I'm a 909 fan. Uh, so I'm going to choose this so you can load up your sample here. You can load up 808. You can do whatever you want with that. Hey, Tyler. Yeah. Our, cat, our cat's asking about levels. Oh, sure. What, what about the levels are you curious about? Um, as far as our project goes, um, we're not really dealing with those too much. Um, I've just got the MIDI controller that's mapped to the level here, and then the master is all I was saying. Oh, yeah. My, my levels, I actually have them um, on my MIDI controller. I have the threshold set a little bit below 128. I think it's set at. Uh, it's like 118 or something was the magic number I found that reduces clipping and it's better for when you're doing resampling and stuff. But for this workshop, it doesn't matter. You can have it all the way up to 128. Okay, cool. Um, so we have our sample. Uh, this is a 909 chain with 32 samples in it. And um, shout out to Ryan for teaching me about chains. I was like, oh, this is cool. Uh, so if we go into the audio editor view, we can we see our the back then. At night, it was just. Oh, uh, not to interrupt, but how did you make it? How did you make it? How did you make it? Yeah. Um, this one actually came with the Octatrack Anniversary Edition. Uh, it was like part of like the pre sets that came with it. Um, oh, wait, no, 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 sorry. This one's a samples from Mars one. So you can get them in like sample packs, but the way I make them is I just open up a DAW, I use live, and then I'll put a sample on um, like every bar. So I'll just have like a 64 bar set and then a sample, you know, on one, on two, on three, on four, all the way up. And then that's just, that's all there is to a chain. Then you just export that. I found Reno's is really nice for this because it has monophonic tracks by default. So you won't get bleed from one sample into the next sample. If, if you have a uh, sample player with that feature, definitely utilize that. Cool, I didn't know that about Reno. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, so this sample is pre-sliced, uh, but if you go to the slice view right here um, and you hit yes, what you want to do, I'm just going to delete all slices just to, so we can start over so you can see this from the beginning. Um, so you just hit yes, and then you say create slice grid. Um, and then you want to choose, obviously, the number that matches with how big your chain is. So this one's 32. If you follow the homework assignment, yours will be 16. Uh, you can also you know, have two, three, four, you know, uh, all the way up to 64. Um, I, uh, for a couple of my last albums, I was working with 64 chains and they're almost like too big to remember everything that's in them. I had like kicks in like one through 16 and then snares in 17 through 32 and then hi hats. And so there's a lot of different ways and conventions you can organize these, but, um, this one's pretty random how the samples laid out, but we know it's 32. That's all that's important. Uh, so hey, yes. And then align markers to zero crosses. I, I'm i kind of mixed on if this matters or not. Um, I don't know if anyone has an opinion on it, but like I haven't really been able to hear a difference. And I know if I make the chains myself, they're 
already exact and clean. So I typically hit no because I favor having everything be equally spaced instead of at zero. And I like some noise in my stuff sometimes, but does anyone have a different opinion on aligning to zero or not? I'm gonna hit no for now. I could hear the difference. Uh, I think you're right that it would be more accurate and that you could, that the difference, uh, if you did let it uh, snap to the zero point crossings, that you would hear uh, the difference there. Yeah. As in like some, sometimes they would come in early and other times late for other slices. So uh, if the, you might not hear it because the attack time is set or the release time or hold time are set correctly so that there is not some unwanted noise there. Yeah, that's a great point. So if, if you do one option and you don't like that, you can always just delete the slices again and remake it. Um, but this just dropped this into the first slice. So if you hit uh, function yes, you can preview each one and then just use the arrow keys to navigate to different slices. So slice two, three, four. Um, so then this is where perhaps one of the most important pieces of technology, of Octatrack technology comes in, which is a uh, piece of paper. Um, I'll go through and I'll say like, oh man, slice four, that's a great snare. Uh, uh, there's a clap, you know. So I'll like I'll go through really quick and just find things I know I want to work with. Like here's a nice little hi hat, and that's just great to do that. Um, the other thing to note is you might want to look at like time stretch stuff. That's out of the scope of what we're doing now, but just know that there's all these options here for that. Um, and you're going to probably want to save your sample settings so that I'll save where all the slices are. Uh, Okay, so now we've got our track um, and our sample sliced. And the other thing to note is you wanna make sure that on the source setup that slice mode is on. Um, that's going to let your, uh, your start parameter here go to a slice. So it's gonna to jump to the slices now instead of whatever it does when it's not in that mode. So with slice one, um, this is slice one, then we can just change this. Now we're on slice two, now we're on slice three. I reference my, the, my notes here. I know that uh, there was a hat on eight, so I can go up to eight. And there's our hat. So that is like the most basic level of how to get samples in and have it be really easy to work with. Uh, because then what you get to do is um, you get to use locks to So now you have access to all those samples just on one track immediately. Um, and you can do a lot of damage with just this. Uh, going further, you can, if you exit record mode, um, or if you're in record mode, you can copy your whole track and paste it. And now you've got, you know, your same slice sample across two tracks. Start doing crazy things like having your scale mode per track. And so say we want this one to be, so then now here's where things start to get fun. Um, we can make this, this sequence, you know, 12 steps long. Uh, this one up here is still 16. So let's say, um, you know, we got a kick going. Um, but then down here we could put, now we get into polyrhythm territory.
So the like key, key takeaway here is slices plus P locks is lets you condense a whole sequence onto a single, a single pattern with a lot of different samples going on. Um, then the other piece of secret sauce is trig conditions. So if you hold down any trig and you hit um, left or right, you get this menu and uh, there's this trig condition here. Right now this step is off and you have all these options in here. So there's percentages. So this is just probability. Uh, so if you have to do that 25, that means 25% of the time the sample is going to fire all the way up to you know 87 or 98, 99. There is no 100 because that's just what off is. That's just every time. Um, but then my favorite feature are the uh, these little ratios here. Um, so like this one is one out of two, which means that every other time this sample is going to play. So now it's not going to play. Now it will play. Uh, so let's add another one on this one. Okay, so now these ones are both off. This one's one out of two, and this one's two out of two. So these are always going to play, and then these are going to alternate when they play. Hey, Tyler, you mind turning up your audio a little bit? I can hear your voice, but not the music very well. Sure. I think it's noise suppression. Oh, is it? Okay. No biggie if you can't do anything about it. Is that better? That's better. All right, I'm going to pause here for a second. Are there any questions or did I go over any part of that that you want to hear again? Just a question, actually. I don't know if I caught if you put uh, flex or static machine or if it matters. Yeah, these are flex machines. Okay. So they should always be flex machines for this? Yeah, my understanding is you can't use slice um, samples with static machines. If someone wants to You can. Them. Oh, you can? Yeah, you definitely can. The restriction with flex machines is that you can't use uh, the track recorders with the static machines. And also, the uh, if you modulate start point with LFOs, it is a little glitchier with static machines. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>, that was, <laughs> that was, <laughs> also using 9.9, so I was like, what the heck is going on? How is it? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so we got flex machines. Um, Ryan, yeah, you just mentioned modulating the start position, which is a really wild thing to do also. Um, so to do that, like, you can do it with, uh, I guess before we do it with an LFO, we can do it with a, a scene, um, it's kind of fun. So I'm gonna set, uh, I'm gonna set one scene to have the start position at 32. And then I'm going to set another scene to have the start position at one. And then we can,
use the crossfader to pan between those. Um, kind of silly with this particular chain, but shows you kind of the fun things you can do with this. If you've turned retrigger up, it might be more obvious. And I think it'll catch the new start point every single retrigger. All right, so we're making a lot of crazy glitch stuff already with that. That's awesome. Um, so uh, also here, um, micro timing, you can nudge your, your triggers a little bit off the grid and on the grid, which is great for approximating swing, or if you've got a sample that's just a little off. So I'll use this a lot too to give things more, more movement. Um, another fun thing to note is when you're in this view, which function page gets you the scale window. Uh, so you can set the length of your pattern directly here. Um, a cool shortcut is you can hit page and it just jumps you up in increments of 16 and then starts over. So this is a really common thing I use a lot. Um, you wanna make sure that if you're over 16, that your master is also over 16. And this, it's kind of funny, like it just increments by one if you turn this, but if you hold function, it'll also do it in jumps of 16. Uh, so you wanna make sure that your master is uh, greater than or equal to whatever your track lengths are. Otherwise it'll never get the, the, the master will restart before um, the scale, the, the individual pattern has a chance to play itself out. So uh, set another way, if, um, if we have our master set to 16 and our pattern on track one is set to 64, it's only gonna play the first 16 steps of that because the master is set to 16. So we wanna bump this up to 64 also. Uh, and then with this, this little number over here, you can change the speed that the pattern plays back. So right now we're at one. Um, I'm actually going to move this down to 16 again. So we're at one and you can see the speed that this is going. So if we change this to, uh, we'll change it to an eighth, so that's really obvious. You can see how much slower this is moving now. So this is really nice if you have certain samples that don't, uh, repeat as often or are more sparse and you don't want to have have to jump through multiple pages to get to them you can kind of condense it all into just one I, I do this a lot like if I've got I don't know if I've got like one or two samples that I only want to happen once in a while I'll make my I'll make the pattern play slower so that I have more so I can see kind of it's, it's like zooming out further in my mind because here um, it'll make more sense probably with sound. Uh, so This is moving really slow. But this one's moving really fast. Uh, you can copy trigs. Um, you just hold down the trig and hit copy, and then you can paste them. 
and this will paste all of the information with it, including any uh, P locks you have or any um, probability stuff you've got going on, any conditional stuff. So this is great to, you can do a bunch of work on one sample and get it just as you want it and then quickly replicate it multiple places. Um, Tyler, um, is it possible to flip the video, uh, like mirror it? So, is that better? Yeah, that's better. Cool. Um, yeah, so with these few tools, that's, I find gets me everything and more that I've ever wanted out of a sequencer. And then the same things all apply for MIDI. So I do this all the time too. If you go into MIDI mode, um, you can do the, everything that we just learned for sequencing samples, you can pretty much do with MIDI as well. Uh, you just have to make sure you've got your ins and outs routed okay, which is a little outside the scope of this, but trigs work the same. Um, the conditions all work the same. So if you wanted a MIDI note, you know, every other time that would still work. Copying and pasting still works. Uh, the scale, I, I hate that it's called scale. The, the length is, can, can be set to things other than 16. Those are decoupled from the tracks. So there's eight MIDI tracks and there's eight uh, just normal tracks, but these don't have to be the same thing. So we could have this be nine long for some crazy reason. And then this one is gonna stay 16. Uh, you can just toggle back and forth to see. So a lot of the time I'll have my my audio, my flex track and my MIDI track be the same length on the same track just so that I'm, I don't lose my mind. But sometimes you wanna do something really crazy like that and have it be playing at different speeds. Um, so you can set the scale length here too. Uh, if you change the master here, that changes the master everywhere. Um, so even though the scale lengths for the tracks are different, the master is global. And then, yeah, like I said, you can copy and paste trigs here. Uh, you can copy entire patterns here. Um, so when you go out of record, or yeah, out of record mode, you can copy the pattern, uh, go to a different track, paste it. Um, so then another fun thing you get to do once you have all these chains is you can um, swap them out in real time. So if we wanted to switch to a 707, it's pre-sliced so you can just load it in and it's going to start working. right away. You can like alternate between them and actually perform it that way. I think if you hit um, Yeah, another thing is depending on how your folders are organized, if you hit function left and right, it goes to the next sample in the bank. So you don't even need to do a whole lot of menu diving to switch these. So you can just be totally crazy and just like, you know, come in here and like mash this a few times and jump to a different chain. Then of course, all we've really worked with so far is the, um, the start, but you can also, P-lock pitch is really fun, or retrigs.
Hey Tyler, someone yeah. in the track is, or in the chat is asking about um, trigless trigs and function in trig, like on the Digitact. Yep. Um, so for that, you just hold function and put down a trig, and then you can use that to uh, key lock other parameters. So like a use case for that might be maybe with some effects or something. Um, Do something obvious, like we do reverb. Uh, we can crank the reverb on this last one, and then it's not be that obvious. But... So in this example, got the reverb cranked on this trig and on this trigless trig, I've got the mix all the way down. So it's open and it closes right away. Uh, but you can map anything to those. So you could do like LFO values or um, pitch you should be able to. I guess you don't really hear that. That's all you gotta do, you just hold function and then hit that, your trig. And then you can, you can see um, your trigless trigs, if you hit function track trig at it, you get this little menu and it's, it's super, it's super hard to see, but all your normal trigs are full rectangles. And then the trigless ones are, it's like half, you probably can't see it too well on the camera, but it's like, it's only half as high. So that's your indicator. Um, and then this also has, uh, you know, any recording trigs or anything that you have there. Um, slide trigs are neat too. Uh, those let you um, essentially automate between two different parameters or as many parameters as you want. So in this example with the trigless one, uh, our mix goes from all the way open on step eight, all the way open on step nine to completely closed on step 10. But if we wanted to have that be a smooth fade instead, we could add a slide trig here. And then um, I think now that it's a slide trig, we can, uh, it should just be a, a straight line down. I think I did that right. Um, something more obvious like the way come on. So now we got a delay. Uh, let's see if we can do this right. Yeah, there we go. So we've got all these different P locks here. Now they're all automating between each other. So from one to four, we're going from these values and it's just gonna linearly interpolate between them. And then from four to nine, it's gonna do the same thing. So you can do a lot of really fun stuff with that. Uh, I think your volume drops a bit when you're not talking. Uh, I don't know if you have like um, a background noise thing going on Zoom. Because uh, I can, the Octatrack pops in when you talk, which is nice. 
but I don't know if it's running right now, but I can't hear it. No, it's not running right now. Okay. Um, it looks like it is. I just have the volume down. Turn off the um, automatically adjust microphone volume and and push the background noise thingy down. Yeah, do you know where that option is? I'm trying to find it. It's in the audio settings under. Are you on a Mac? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, under preferences. An audio. Yep. And then uh, there should be there's like a suppress, box. Suppress background noise. Yeah. And put that on low, I think, is the best option. OK, just did. Uh, is this any better? Oh, yeah. OK. Perfect. Can, can I ask a quick question? I yeah. might have missed it. But if you want to uh, live perform with or live record with your slices, uh, how do you do that? Because when you hit record, uh, mode on the, the grid, you know, you can only push in uh, trigs, but if you want to live record them, how do you do that? Oh, I don't know. I never no. do that. I always sequence it. Wait, yeah. um, I can you jump ask. in on that one. I Thank you. Um, just, I always just do uh, record play and then it, and then it does the, if you're in um, your slice mode, go to uh -huh. like, uh change your from tracks to slices and then you can hit record and play and then it will go into record and you can just play the trigs okay that's cool thank you could you show that tyler yeah So it's just record play. Oh, cool. <laughs> awesome. The new uh, OS, the new firmware, also added the ability to play those with MIDI. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, so I did that really fast, but to recap, what I just did is uh, went to the track with the slices, made sure that we're still on slice mode. Um, function down, you can change what your view is here, whether tracks or chromatic or slots. I went to slices because I wanted to see it. And then you get this little grid down here that shows what all your slices are. And then outside of record mode, each trig is going to map to a different slice. What does this go to just the next page? Yeah, cool. So then um, you probably want some type of click in the background or something, but. And then you just hit record play. And this is blinking, so that means we can record our stuff in real time now. something new. I didn't know how to do that. Thank you. Um, another thing that I always have set up is I typically have a uh, the DJ equalizer on every single FX1 slot. And then I do that because I have the low, mid, and high each mapped to my MIDI controller. Um, so then I can, I, I can use my MIDI controller just like kind of a traditional mixer that way. So lows are like this row. So I know every single track has 
uh, I can control the low and every single track I can control the mid and every single track I can control the high. So um, I find that really a really pleasurable way to work because it's really immediate. You can get nice mixes that way. So I'm a really big fan of conventions like that because um, I, I think the, the more I learn about Octatrack, the more, you know, obviously like there's, we've all heard the critiques about how it's really overwhelming and it's really deep and there's so much you can do. And uh, what I've found is whatever conventions you can set up for yourself that you, that you do and kind of like um, the get, getting defining your own deer trails with it that you can use over and over again is really helpful to anchor you. Um, so like f for me, you know, like I have this, this MIDI controller always does the same thing on every single Octatrack set. I always have, like, I've always got control over volume and I've always got control over my EQ. And that's just like one little thing that is, keeps me anchored and not getting totally and completely lost with stuff. Uh, and then like another convention I have is I try to keep most of my patterns to one single page. Sometimes I have to go longer to like bigger pages, but you can do so much between like essentially the, the reason I think there's so much fun sequencing on this thing is with these, with trade conditions, you essentially have, um, it's essentially like you have multiple bars just on top of each other in the same one. So, uh, like an example is, um, let's get a noise that's not totally annoying. So, okay, so we just have simple metronome or whatever. Um, if we put a four out of four here, what that means is the fourth time this trig is gonna happen. So one, two, three, and then so essentially in this one 16 step pattern, we essentially have a 64 step pattern because this happens at the very end. So if you think about it that way, um, you can do really intricate, complex interlocking sequences with only a few steps. And that's just on one track. Then we start doing that on multiple tracks with different conditions that aren't all base four. I mean, these, I have so much fun just with these. So you've got everything from one to two to eight to eight. So 
you can do something every seven times, every third out of seven, every fourth out of six, every two out of five. So you can just get really intricate with it. And I, it, the, it's like pretty much for that reason alone, this is my desert island sequencer slash instrument, um, just because that's that's just how I like to write music. Another trick with those trick conditions uh, is you can use micro timing to basically slide the subsequent or previous step to overlap it and whichever one, um, depending on what your trick conditions are, they'll like effectively mute each other. Mm -hmm. And you can apply trick conditions to either of those too. So it can get pretty complex. Yeah, so a great example of that. Um, let's, let's say we want a a different noise on the first beat of our four, uh, on the first bar of our four bar uh, sequence that we have here. So we have, you know, we have this one that hits, it's like kind of like a fill at the end. I'll make it a little bit more obvious with some extras. Okay, so we have our fill at the end and then let's say we want like a crash or something at the beginning, but we can't do that on one because we have, we already have a sample there. Uh, so we can do it on two though. And then if you go into the micro timing and you move this all the way over, uh, it says negative 23 over 384, which I don't really understand how the math here works. Uh, some, of the, some of these make more sense, like negative 164th. I, I, I wish I could tell you, and Ryan, do, do you know what this actually means negative 23 over 384 because that's a very I, small I think, number <laughs> yeah i think the uh it's just like a 16th note so it's like a 384th note <laughs> so for whatever the whatever but, the numerator over that is it's pretty ridiculous so it works out to be like you know milliseconds um less than a 16th note or something oh i see Okay, that makes that makes some sense. Um, I I think I need a diagram of fractions represented as bars to really understand that. But long story short, open this up, put a trig right next to your other trig, and scoot it all the way over. And now these samples are effectively happening at the same time. So then we'll put a trig condition on this that says uh, one out of four, because we only want it to happen on the first time. And uh, I'll just choose a different sample for that. Um, a little pop, that higher one. So that's this guy now. I'll make it more pronounced. And you can do that forward and backward. So we went backwards with these, but you could some one one trick I've sometimes found is like these two might be occupied in my sequence. You can actually put it at the very end and move it all the way forward. That effectively wraps it around to here. Uh, so you can get really really clever with how you do all that. So I think that about sums it up. Um, happy to answer any questions or talk about anything else.
Oh, we've got some math here. Is this negative 23 yeah. over 384 equals negative 0 0.059? So they're really close. Okay. Yeah, cool. So yeah, that first sample will, that is something to keep in mind since each track is effectively monophonic, um, that first sample will trigger and then it will play for, what's that? 0 0.0625 minus 0 0.059. For 0 0.0035 seconds, that sample will play. Um, but a lot of time that's totally fine because you've got other stuff going on or maybe you actually want to hear it that short or and then there's even more intricate stuff you could do with trade conditions there too so i'll also combine that with um i guess let me just jump back over uh um I'll combine that technique. So this one's playing one out of four. Um, I'll switch it and of this one play, uh, how you do this. So there's this other mode in here that's previous uh, PRE means this only plays if the previous one plays and the line over the top negates that. So that means this one only plays if the previous one doesn't play. So with those, you can effectively pr programmatically mute or activate each of these. So we could have this first one be set to, um, uh, so we'll set this one to one out of two. I'll erase all these. So this first one's just one out of two, and then the second one is gonna be um, if the previous one doesn't play, the really simple, um, and now they're just going to alternate. But if we change this to like something else, so we change it to one out of three. So that's one, that's two. And that's three. So by doing that, we're, we're essentially programming two steps at once. Uh, and does anyone know what the neither does? I haven't actually used that one before. I assume that stands for neither. I think it's neighbor. Yeah, I think it is neighbor. Oh, neighbor. Yeah, I think that's right. Oh, I think so it has to do with neighboring tracks, maybe. That sounds right. Oh, that's interesting. So if that trig on a neighboring track played or didn't play? To create like cascading events, I would assume. I don't know, I've never done it before. That sounds right, yeah. And I think most of those apply to whatever the previous trig was. So it's probably the last thing that played on the neighbor. Interesting. So with pre, if something, if a trig exists between two that have the precondition or uh, I don't know how to say it I guess can a trig interrupt that condition or a trigless trig or any kind of trig I think it's only if it has a condition on it okay that's just my guess though I really don't know <laughs> How could we test that? Uh, I'm having a hard time visualizing. So, so I think you just you put a pre after the one you already had, right? Okay. Then what? Um, And then we need another pre like later in the bar. Probably not on three. Yeah. Oh. Okay. And then just throw something on five or six, I guess.
Did that have a condition on it? No. This is source three. I don't understand. This is great. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's going on either. Uh, I think the neighbor, are you messing around? I, I went elsewhere for a minute. Are you guys messing around with the neighbor thing? No, we're, we're trying to Here understand how far pre uh, looks. It looks like it. Because we have we have a condition on two, right? It's pre. Or no, that's just a pre. Okay, was there a condition on one? No. Okay. That, I don't know what's going on. This is very strange to me. <laughs> It's like the pre was getting a condition from nowhere. I wonder if you found a bug or something. So. Shouldn't that be playing if it's on pre? Did you have a condition on one? I didn't see it. No. Maybe, yeah, give it like 99 for, yeah, or something like that. One out of two. Sure. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. So that so what that means is off doesn't count for pre. Uh, you have to have something there. That yeah. makes sense. Okay. Oh, that, that sort of reminds me. Um, the other one in here that's really interesting is um, fill, uh, which is actually the very first option when you're holding one down and you turn level fill. Um, what fill does is if you go into fill mode, it'll play it. And if you're not in fill mode, it won't. So f f fill mode, it's much simpler on the did uh, did you tone and digitax where you just can hold page down and you do a fill? Um, on this, you have to actually hit down up page to lock it and then up page to release it. But this is really cool for uh, fills, obviously. But um, let me just. Um, So here we have like quarter notes. And then with a the fill, now we have eighth notes. So it's yet another way to have even more, like the, the, the patterns on this thing, the only word I can use to describe them is holograms. They're like holographic because there's multiple layers. So imagine now taking what we've learned and combining them together uh, with like fills and then like previous trigs and then conditional and then slide trigs. So you can have all those things kind of interlocking with each other. Uh, and then all that stuff works with MIDI. So I write a lot of melodies with that stuff in mind, you know, having notes probabilistically happen or, you know, every couple times happen or something like that. Um, and then turning on a fill and then all of a sudden it builds up you know, more layers or chords come in and you can you can be really economical with your tracks that way if you combine it with fills. Can't seem to exit the fill mode. Uh, uh oh. Down, up, or hold up, hold up and then hit page. It. I was doing up, down, and then page. Yeah, down, up, page, locks it, and then up, page, releases it. I need to make a cheat sheet. Yeah, I, I had a really angry Instagram post a few weeks ago that showed the differences between fill mode on the Digitone versus the Octatrack. There's, there's zero overlap. Like, they are completely different, and it's so frustrating. Like, it... I just like had it. That's why I have a whiteboard there. It's like right in front of me until I finally remember how to do it because it's so hard to remember.
Very cool. Um, I'm going to stop recording. Thanks everyone in the future for watching, but we'll keep hanging out here for a little bit. Uh, I can figure out how to stop recording. Uh, I guess I can't have to edit and post. Oh no, it's up there. Stop recording.